Hey everybody, welcome back to Introduction to Folklore. Uh, I'm Ian, as ever, and today we're talking about folk objects, material culture, things, stuff. Um, it's the same. The, 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 when we talk about material culture, when we talk about these folk objects, we need to remember that first we approach them the same way that we approach other objects of folklore, that they are performances, that they are unique, that they are present in context, that they are, uh, that the, the maker is bringing the resources of their group, of their understanding, of, of purpose. Uh, they are going to be found apt. They are uh, informed by a sense of connection with the past. They are uh, nevertheless done at the contemporary moment when certain decisions are made. They are made for, uh, intelligently made for aesthetic person, uh, purposes, for moral purposes, and so on. They function exactly the same way as a story or a joke. But the big difference, of course, is that they are things. They have tangibility. They take, first of all, they take time to create. They, unlike a story, which might be done spontaneously, an object to be made requires a certain amount of, a certain amount of uh, preparatory effort. Not entirely. There's, there are things that can be made more or less spontaneously, like um, cootie catchers, you know, uh, the uh, fortune teller things that people make out of paper. That, that would be an object of material culture that requires a specific skill set and, and so on. But it has, uh, but for the most part, when we're talking about something like a chair or a cane or a barn or something, those are objects that they are not spontaneous in the same way that uh, a, a tail might be spontaneous. Um, and the other thing is that they last. They, they have substance. They're durable. They are tangible. In folklore uh, and in larger circles, we'll talk about intangible cultural heritage as being a fancy name that the United Nations has put on what basically a folklorist would call folklore. Things, uh, uh, products of culture that exist only by virtue of humans continuing to do them. So uh, certain kinds of performances, certain kinds of practice, languages, um, enactments and so on. But uh, that the word intangible contrasts that with tangible, something that has durability independent of a particular um, of, of a particular actor. Uh, once it is made, it exists in time and space. Not all objects last forever, of course, because you, you can talk about the material culture of you can talk about things like an an, an ice statue as an object of material culture, which clearly doesn't last, or a butter sculpture. You could talk about um, the laying of a table as an act of material culture um, and, and a folk object. You can, um, things that are just goods that are going to be used and are likely to be worn, uh, worn away. So clothing doesn't necessarily last that long and it's actually the exception when we have an object of clothing from 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 prior time so the materiality of it um, doesn't mean it's going to endure forever but it can endure for an awfully long time this is a point I usually bring at the end but since I'm talking about the durability of objects and, and certain forms that uh, that are less durable than others one of the interesting things about how um, because you could think about the material material culture as the things that are in a, that can be placed in a museum because they're durable. They are remnants of a prior time. They exist in a prior. They exist from a prior time, and you can um, you can uh, keep them. You can you can uh, retrieve them. You can discover them if you're sort of the the, the anthropological archaeological folklorist. You can discover them. You can bring them into a place. You can store them. You can house them, and so on. So when we talk about intangible cultural heritage, one of the things is how do you preserve a thing that requires enactment? As you know, it's easy more or less to preserve a building because it lasts. But how do you preserve a dance? You need the you need the, uh, to cultivate the wherewithal in order to uh, continue it. But going back to that museum aspect, you know the things that if you think about what's often in a museum, um, they are they are objects that often have an intense durability because they are not made from fragile things, uh, and they don't necessarily wear away in time. So the material culture of women is not often as represented in um, in museums as the material culture of men, because the material culture of men is often dealing with materials like wood and steel and iron and stuff that just lasts. Whereas the material culture of women is often things that are made in order to be eventually uh, destroyed. For example, 
the laying of a table. For example, and we're, of course we're talking about an incredibly standard heteronormative gender division of labor. And, and But if we want to think about the legacy of women, we have to think about the material culture that they produced under those conditions. Uh, and that isn't a necessary function. Uh, n that isn't the necessary aspect of the material culture of women. That are the conditions that have been historically in place of the material culture of women. And of course, not entirely, because we do have quilts, we do have fabric objects, but they are less. They are. They tend to be less durable. So, uh, historically, when we don't see these in our museums, we sort of have sometimes associated material culture much more with, with a, a men's tradition, whereas we want to recognize that there's just as much, if not more, material culture making among women, save for the fact that the material culture, the energy, the, the activity that goes into their creation is often um, for an object that has just a shorter lifespan because it's cyclical and so on. Anyway, so they're things, they last, they can, and because they last and because they're tangible, um, they can, they sort of, they almost take on the idea of objective because they, I will go back to the idea that they exist in performance and that they're best understood as an object that was created for a particular time, at a particular place, for a particular community, voila. But knowing that they are durable and the fact that they are durable, they can be taken, um, they persist after that context. They're of course designed, for the most part, when we're talking about a durable object, they, they're designed to persist after that particular moment. And they therefore do, so they can be measured, they can be quantified in, in, in different ways, and they can also be repurposed and reused. One of the neat things about material culture study is that since the object exists, uh, once it is made, it exists independent of its maker. Um, so it can be it can be, as it were, re-performed, or at the very least, it can be reconceptualized. So, you have an object. Let's just say, uh, let's just say, a walking stick. You have an object that someone has made, and perhaps someone has made it, and then they have presented it to someone else, and then that is, you know, your grandfather's walking stick, and they use it. In, you know, they use it for walking. They they use it, you know, perhaps proudly, perhaps as a walking a walking stick for special occasions as opposed to a more durable one. Perhaps they preserve it in part because it is a gift, um, but preserve it in terms of they, they only use it for special occasions. But then your grandfather dies and then it becomes yours and you don't use it as a walking stick because you live in the 20th, 21st century and you don't really use walking sticks much. But what you do do is you use it, is, use it as a memory of your grandfather. Uh, and then, you know, you pass away and you and someone else takes it and they say, well, this is a w wonderful piece of art. How do I use it? Maybe you hang it on the wall. Maybe you turn it into something like a, uh, a um, something that, you know, to, to hang a tapestry off of or something. So the object can be multiply used. When it ha passes hands, it can be used in a different way, which is kind of neat because one of the things we want to s consider is that Folk objects are not always those that are made by the folk, because one of the things that we can do is we can take the objects of material culture um, around us that are provided by mass culture, by, by uh, mass production, and we can repurpose them. So if you think about things like um, what you're wearing right now, um, you might be particularly crafty, but I would imagine that most, if not all, of the things that you are wearing at this moment, you did not make. If you happen to be outside and it's a scarf and you're a knitter, well then, screw me, I guess I made a mistake. But for the most part, I imagine that you, um, most of the things that you are wearing currently are, are bought. We don't really produce our clothes in the same way. The clothes that we do produce are very special things. Maybe like my grandmother made my prom dress, but your grandmother probably didn't make the seven t-shirts that are kicking around in your t in your uh, room right now. So you have, you know, you have uh, Old Navy, you have Reitman's or whatever, and you you can get clothing from there. You do get clothing from there, but first of all, you pick it out. You make choices about how you're going to present yourself through objects, what you are communicating through the the objects that you clad yourself on. You then have favorites. You juxtapose. You put these items into context when you're going out on a Friday night versus where you're going to church on Sunday because you're all very good people. And uh, or you know what you roll into class wearing. You are making decisions based on the and communicating something based on material objects. 
um, you can repurpose them. You can take a shirt, you can cut it up in a, in a variety of ways, and you can make it you can make it a distinct object. Not simply that you are using it in a distinct way, but you are modifying it in a way. So it, that's part of the process, and that's something to consider when we think about other forms of folk objects that don't aren't necessarily material. When if we want to start thinking of, and I'm going to save this when I talk about digital folklore, but we start thinking about like the creation of memes. You're taking images, you're taking fonts, and um, nevertheless you are juxtaposing them, you're creating them in, into something new. Um, and by taking you know, images and fonts and stuff, that, that's another aspect of material culture, that historically you're using objects that are in the found environment. So this is where I, I, you know, I'm constantly switching back between the 17th or whatever and the 21st centuries when I'm talking, uh, but hopefully to demonstrate that there actually is a, a continuity of... Um, of a, our attitudes towards folk objects, if not necessarily a continuity in context, because, or, or, or even, even in disparate contexts, because you, uh, you know, you take stuff from the found environment, so wood, so, you know, um, rocks, you know what a found environment is, wool, you found, find your sheep, and you, that is what you create your objects out of. Um, Nevertheless, you know, we have the material culture of uh, industrial culture. So the really interesting stuff that is done with ironworks and in Sydney or Pennsylvania or anywhere where there's like big steel plants and you have people who are professional, you know, their, their, their day jobs are, are welding and, 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 and uh, uh, facility with steel, they will often make folk art as well but uses those skills and uses stuff from the environment, steel that is often procured from the plant, and they will make new objects out of that. So they're found environment. Again, sometimes we limit ourselves to particular materials because we are imposing an aesthetic of traditionality. That's totally fine. If you go to the craft center down in, in, in Sydney, most of the materials that are present are uh, emphasize that they are you know locally sourced or, or made uh, or you know grown in Cape Breton certainly like the, you know the wood and, and uh, uh, the, uh, the wood carvings and so on that, that there's a sense of place and a sense of found environment within that craft um, but that's an aesthetic that's a that's a parameter that someone is imposing on on these things on occasion and it is not a necessary condition so you can bring whatever you have and you can create an object anew and then it has some kind of tangibility um, there's a skill I mean some objects have greater or lesser skills to make but you know that they are development and then 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 they become a demonstration of skill they become something that uh, because we can uh, in the same way that we can really see uh, what a great story sounds like, and we know people who are particularly practiced at it, and we, they take the occasion to do that, and we take the occasion to let them do that, like tell a story, Grandpa. Um, we do the same thing with objects, so that people who have a reputation for being a maker, um, we are, and we know that their skill set might eclipse ours, and so the status can be accorded. So it is. I always go back to things like your grandmother's quilts or your your uh, uh, your grandfather's whittling or whatever. I don't know why I always go back to grandparents. It's a it's a trite example, but I think it illustrates it quite well. Um, so um, so the, you know a, a definite skill set. And it's a skill set that takes time, and it's a skill set that then becomes manifested in the object itself. So just the, although we can appreciate the story as it is being told, it is still, still nevertheless has that ephemerality. With the object, we can subsequently um, figure out the, the skill set and the, the intelligence that went into it, the sense of design. If you think about skill set, not simply in terms of how to handle a tool, but how to conceive of a project and how to meet the expectations of the community for what this object ought to be while simultaneously doing something that provides you status in terms of doing it in an exemplary or a surprising and yet still nevertheless effective way, you have this aspect um, that, that's in place. And they do have, they are made from stuff and stuff has value. And the idea that, that uh, again, we don't want to necessarily fundamentally distinguish these as, as absolutes, but because they have durability, the value, the work, the labor, the materials that goes into an object can persist in that object. So, 
we can talk about how we can talk about how the material often has a value extrinsic of its use. So um, the the traditional use of uh, of uh, gold, for example, you can take gold, you can put it into an object, uh, you can um, uh, manipulate it, you can form it, and it becomes a uh, material culture good that um, does that same thing. It might be a gift, it might demonstrate some kind of status, it might uh, have some symbolic role, like the use of uh, the evil eye ornaments in uh, in uh, Anatolia, in uh, Alpin Ojdemir's reading, I'm just going to put a little link to that to the video that I do for another class on that, and that you know the gold has a value in and of itself um, that is both has certain magical properties in terms of its reflective, but it's it's also a piece of gold, and so by so it has is something that you could recognize as both um, uh, as both uh, uh, culturally valuable and economically valuable. Um, and so it can endure. We can certainly imagine stories as having value, but they don't necessarily have the same kind of value that goes into a exchange economy, which is something to consider. But I don't want to just be crass, and, and obviously there's craft, obviously there's craft economies, obviously there is craft sales and there are you know folk markets and so on. You can go and get handcrafted goods and Dumb people like me from the cities can go like, oh, look at this, and and buy something that is that is particularly uh, distinct, and money can be generated in that way. But that isn't one hundred percent the point that I'm trying to make. The point that I'm trying to make is that um, they can also be function as gifts, and gifts are an entirely remarkable category of material goods because it's basically, if you think of what a gift is, it's seeding an object of value. It is here is something that. Um, costs in some way. It costs the material, it costs labor in order for me to produce, or of course, you know, not every gift is homemade, but you know, we, we buy a gift, but here is something, and then I am seeding economic value uh, and presenting it to you as a demonstration of our relationship. And that is a thing in and of itself. And so, uh, you know, we might gift someone with a song, we might gift someone with, uh, with our presence, we might gift someone with a dance, but Fundamentally, when you're bringing a housewarming gift to someone, it's a thing, and it's that thing is has a sense of durability. It also has the idea that without even talking about um, sympathetic magic, that there is a connection that exists in that object. And we will often talk about the um, Barbara Kirschenbach Gimlet has this whole remarkable perfect reading, which we're going to talk about more when we talk about John Kay and his reading about uh, his article about Marion Sykes. But the idea that one of the things about objects is that as they enter into our lives, they become um, what she calls objects of memory, that they become occasions, many of them, not all objects clearly, but they become occasions for uh, life review. She did a lot of work with uh, seniors. She did a lot of work with um, particularly seniors who were uh, uh, either uh, either Holocaust survivors or survivors of uh, or you know of that generation. And you can just go if you go into like any um, well your house definitely, but it seems to be something that accrues over life. So an an, an elder's house. And they will have objects, they'll have obviously photographs where they, a person is represented, they'll have mementos, which will, um, which a, a, a memento reminds someone of a place, of a person, and a souvenir reminds someone of a place or a, uh, an event. Um, so they'll have uh, objects that maybe were created, maybe they created themselves of life, of uh, you know, a piece of their life. So some people will do memory quilts, or some people will do paintings of their childhood. Marion Sykes does these rugs that are, that are memories of her early life, and they become these objects of, um, they become narr narratives. They, they become, you enter into their presence, and uh, even if you're by yourself, you enter into their presence, and, and each object has a, a memory behind it. I'm just looking around right now, and unfortunately, the only thing that I can see that is immediately here is a chess set. And then once, once I pick it up, the pieces are all going to go. But hold on. So this is, a, uh, this is the uh, rook from a chess set. You know, it's 
it looks homemade. It probably was homemade, but at the same time, within like a craft economy sort of thing. I think it's like one, from one of those one thousand, you know, ten thousand villages sales that they uh, used to have. It is um, a chess set that is done in African art style, and I'm not a huge chess person. Um, I'm in introducing my son to it, and he's he beats me uh, regularly, which is kind of distressing. But um, I have this this peculiar set, so that's the rook. I will show you the knight, where they use a giraffe's head, for example. And um, but more importantly, um, that was a gift. That was a gift from my friend uh, uh, Virginia Preston, and um, and I so I've had it for for years, and it's 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 on display in my house right now. Um, she didn't make it, but she gifted it to me, and it's not the value of it in terms of, oh, this is going to be worth something someday. It's a memory that I have of, of a, a, a loved friend. So, anyway, I digress, but objects do that too. Objects become, they are, they, uh, because they persist, they have value uh, that might be economic, but just as importantly, it is about the, uh, they're often about relationships, and they're often about the narratives associated with other people. Um, new objects can be created, so we can talk about things that are um, that uh, might be you know a, a traditional uh, uh, skill set, but are applied to a new thing. Uh, I've already talked about how the utilitarian skill set of the manual labor of steel plants and so on then become turned into works of art. Um, it's interesting when we do talk about craft economies and we think about the history of, say, just in the Cape Breton context, either Mi'kmaq basketry or uh, Shetakamp hooked rugs, uh, both of which were, um, were skills and the, the making of objects that were important for the day-to-day -day operations in those, in those communities. You, know, you, need, you need baskets to store. You know, store stuff. I don't need to explain the concept of basket to you, do I? And you need rugs for uh, comfort and, and often for insulation and so on. Um, then outsiders, again, pasty people like myself from big cities, saw these and wanted wanted to buy them, wanted those to enter into some kind of market exchange, and then also sort of suggested changes of the form. Can you make a big one? I need a basket that's like, yay. I need one to sort of, you know, it's going to be for like my remote control caddies, or I just want a small, I, my rug I don't need a rug. I need a small thing. I want like a, like a, a coasters. Can you do coasters? And they're like, yeah, we can do coasters, I guess. And so they can take this and apply it to a non-traditional use that nevertheless retains that issue of traditionality. Objects can be repurposed. Uh, skill sets can be reapplied in different ways. There's a, it's a distinction that is very, very notional. Uh, but sometimes we want to talk about that because I've already introduced the idea uh, but simply by referring to like the craft center uh, in downtown Sydney. Uh, the, we will sometimes, and the we is a, it's a difficult question, but you know, sometimes people distinguish craft and art, and that art is a different thing from craft, and we, we somehow. And it's a very notional distinction. It's clearly based in issues of class, it's clearly based in issues of how we perceive the role of the artist within particular contexts, like is is it only art if it's someone who um, is identified by other people as an artist and that is their fundamental foremost occupation, or they have been officially trained through prosciniums or prosciniums? Sure, whatever. Uh, through institutes, they've been for, they've gone through some kind of formal training, and so only a certain category of of um, of uh, application of skills qualifies as art, and everything else is just craft. Does it require? Does it imply the sort of um, idiosyncratic notion of genius that again we we use in certain forms of intelligence, and then we don't label other forms of intelligence that way? Maybe. Again, it's very class, very, very, very uh, notionally based. But one of the ways we can consider the difference, perhaps, is that most things that we might identify as, as craft typically have a utilitarian purpose as well. Are they, and they more are rooted in their utilitarian purpose. So, um, because 
just like just going back to our basic ideas again we, we want to think of these things in the same way that we think of all folklore uh, that uh, uh, artistic communication in small groups definition um, we often will think about like in terms of language that we have something that we could be saying like a like goodbye goodbye is just something that we say uh, or you know we, we present some kind of farewell formula but the way we say it might be culturally conditioned like yeah oh, well gotta go gotta make like a banana and split or sorts of things we might introduce a piece of artistry to it that meet that we know will meet the local aesthetics that we that we do so and then the, we commune so it has it has its functional purpose um, these are the social function functional purpose of of a, a group temporarily suspending its its uh, um, co-presence to each other uh, simultaneously we um, uh, have a way of um, doing it in that is uh, reminiscent that through the artistic processes reaffirms that group sense of, of connection to each other and that's like, so it's a formula we want to think saying things like a bowl that a bowl does something a bowl has a purpose to it, it has a, it does have a function and you know there are for the, the subcategory of bowls where there might be shallow and deep and so on um, you know different bowls different sizes and, and, and so on and they serve different functions you know for what what purpose is going to be used soup rice fruit um, but then you know how it's designed certain aspects of the shape the notion of like the lip the materials that it's made from um, those are going to be uh, basically artistic considerations the artistic consideration of the larger group in terms of how they understand bowl and how they understand decoration and how they understand the the aesthetic value and then the particular idiosyncratic gloss that one maker might have on that uh, uh, place atop that so um, how did I get to that point yeah oh yeah and so uh, it's a notional distinction, but you might say that all all material objects have a potential utilitarian purpose and a um, and an aesthetic to it. And are crafts the ones where the utilitarian is either uh, either its primary use or at least it's foregrounded? So we can think of things like. You can think, go back to hooked rugs in that, um, you know, they are, um, even though they are now almost purely decorative, that you don't put them on the floors. Um, you don't want to do damage. You, 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 they are so imbued with, with value, economic value, representational value, that you want to preserve them as best you can. So they really don't have that function anymore. Nevertheless, that function is foregrounded by virtue of what we name it. And we're so, so we're still calling it craft even though there's no reason for us not to call it art whereas objects whose primary mode is um, aesthetic uh, and its primary mode is simply to be an object of value and an object of appreciation um, are those things that we call art at least in potency and then we might sort of distinguish the art that you know you can buy at the poster shop uh, you know the, the the paintings from Sears, as Billy Joel says, uh, to you know the art that is in the, the fine museums, and then we have a, a yet another class distinction issue. So it's a really kind of fun question. Uh, so material culture is and the folk object is just this wonderful avenue um, for exploration because we have these things. We exist in a world of things. Uh, and they demonstrate the same kind of things that other forms of, of uh, folk performance demonstrate. Uh, an understanding of place, a, uh, that they exist in context. It's not that all objects are gifts, but all objects um, have some kind of have some kind of use that they are they are created in part for the conditions of use and the conditions of use are determined by the group itself. Oh, well, that's a good way of putting it. Uh, and so, but they also persist in time, so we can look at them in a way that's different from how we look at another object, and they can take um, they can take different meanings. Uh, the, 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 they, they they eclipse the uh, they eclipse their performer 
because uh, they they exist after the performer has done their performance. They 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 are now in place, and other people can pick it up and fundamentally perform that object uh, and bring it into to different aspects. I haven't even talked about the idea of like material culture being an important part of custom in terms of you know the dress that is worn, or even of course the elaborate. I mean, like a, a cathedral, a church is you know an an, an object of material uh, culture. Obviously, something of that size is is typically supported by the institution in the state might eclipse the the uh, mechanisms of the local but if you think about like the wooden church in St. Anne's and that was entirely built by local craftspeople uh, and this sort of e enormous wooden church that they, they wanted a, a thing that resembled sort of a European style pseudo cathedral and it's entirely made of, of wood because they are they're wood craftsmen it's a remarkable piece of, of folk architecture that and a collaborative aspect uh, but using sort of the same mechanisms that they would use for barn construction and, and like I was talking about things I was talking about yeah material culture that 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 uh, you know is part of our your customary lore uh, all the time uh, so that's a thing but material culture is uh, again just to, just to summarize it's a thing and so while we think about things, we can apply different levels of criteria to them in terms of we can measure them in a way that we just can't really measure a story. We can value them literally in the way that we can't quite value a story because <sighs> tangible things have some kind of market, market economy. Uh, but they, and but they can shift in time because they have because they persist over time. They can be reiterated, reinstanced in a way that a story can't be reinstanced. And this is kind of a fun dynamic. The question of the week, I don't have it in front of me, but it is basically describe an object that's meaningful to you and that, that you have. Uh, maybe if you've moved here, that you brought with you, that doesn't serve necessarily any real function, but is an object that it is important to you. It doesn't have to be homemade, but it probably has a connection with a person or a place. Um, and that person or place is probably someone who is important to you, even if they're, you're not important to them, because it could be something like a, like a Rick Astley poster. But anyway, an object, that something is communicated through this object. Uh, if it's homemade, cool, but think about it. Anyway, I will talk to you uh, soon. The reading is John McKay's uh, chapter on Marion Sykes. And uh, yeah, okay, I'm done. Bye-bye.